Good evening, and welcome to the second of our three events of Impolitaires and BBP's joint legal series. Today, we will focus on the role of the executive, the judiciary, and, in the, and indeed Parliament in the context of triggering Article 50 of the Treaty on European Union following the United Kingdom's referendum result in June 2016 to leave the EU. Article 50 of the Treaty on European Union states that any member may, may decide to withdraw from the Union in accordance with its own constitutional requirements. On the 29th of March 2017, our government triggered Article 50, which formally started the United Kingdom's withdrawal process from membership of the EU. The legal challenges brought by Miller and Dos Santos, with many interested parties intervening, question the constitutionality of triggering Article 50 without a vote in Parliament. Today, our distinguished speakers will discuss the constitutional aspects of triggering Article 50 and the implications of judicial intervention in this largely political matter for the balance of power between the three branches of government going forward. We are delighted to welcome our speakers to share their thoughts. Andrew Chadwick is the Dean of BBB Law School Andrew has over 20 years experience in legal education. He has overall responsibility for all aspects of BPP Law School's business, including teaching, program design, operational and strategic management. Andrew will say a few words about this year's BPP Politaire Legal Series. Dr. Sheila Lawler, the founder and research director of Politaire will introduce the political context and set the scene for, for today's discussion. Dr. Lawler's working life began in Cambridge as a 20th century British political and constitutional historian. She has authored many publications, including Churchill and the Politics of War. Jessica Seymour, Queen's Counsel, practices at Matrix Chambers. She's a leading specialist in public, regulatory, EU and human rights law. She has particular experience in data protection, privacy, tax, regulatory and competition law across different industries and in civil liberties work. Jessica represented the second claimant, Dos Santos, in the Crown on the application of Miller and another and the Secretary of State for exiting the European Union in 2017 at the UK Supreme Court. That was the challenge to the Prime Minister's decision to use the royal prerogative to notify the EU of the UK's intended withdrawal under Article 50 of the Treaty on European Union. So William Cash has served as a Member of Parliament since 1984. So William was the founder of the Maastricht referendum campaign in the early 90s and is chairman of the House of Commons European Scrutiny Committee. Before entering politics, he qualified and practiced as a solicitor. Christopher Knight is a barrister at 11 Kings Bench Walk with a particular specialism in media and privacy law and in Brexit related matters. He acted as junior counsel for the Secretary of State for exiting the European Union in Miller in the Supreme Court in 2017. He was one of the lawyers representing the government in the Supreme Court in 2020 over the decision to prorogue Parliament. Among his many other achievements, Christopher is an editor of the White Book and a member of the Editorial Committee of Public Law. The speakers have kindly agreed to take questions. Please write them in the Zoom chat box. Andrew, would you like to say a few words, please? Hello, good evening, and thank you very much, uh, Edite, for your introduction. Um, it's a great pleasure for us to uh, participate in these events with Politea, not least because um, we are always um, put uh, in front of um, very interesting and knowledgeable speakers um, about the particular area which uh, is to be debated. Um, constitutional law has always been a part um, of any law degree or conversion course syllabus. And it's been a subject which has, I think, interested uh, many students, but possibly not as much as subjects such as crime, um, which are always found to be interesting by the great majority. Um, I would say, however, that in the last uh, five years, constitutional law has gone up the popularity list um, insofar as students are concerned because they've seen how um, how important it is and how the different branches um, of government don't necessarily always work 
um, in unison um, with each other. So the whole Brexit debate and the cases which followed have, I think, um, really sparked uh, a renewed interest in constitutional law. And I'm sure the students who are attending today will find it very interesting to listen to the speakers um, who were involved um, in those cases. So thank you very much for um, uh, agreeing to put on this series with us. Thank you, Andrew. May we now turn to Dr. Sheila Lawler. Thank you very much, Adite. And uh, I'm going to start off by, by talking about the background because five years is a very long time in politics, but the five years since 2016's referendum seem like an eternity. Four of those years were marked by bitter Brexit battles within and between parliament, government and people. So before, before we start today's legal discussion about the Supreme Court's 2017 decision on the government's power to trigger the mechanism to leave the EU without consulting Parliament, I want to recall how things stood in 2017. I shall consider three points. One, David Cameron's decision to hold a referendum. What was the context? What were the implications? Two, Theresa May's victory as Conservative leader and decision to trigger Article 50. How did these things happen and what did it mean for Brexit? And third point will be challenging government or Brexit. So to the first point, David Cameron's announcement of a referendum in, in January 2013. He told the voters they could settle the contentious question of EU membership by the simple device of an in or out referendum. Losing it wasn't thought a live possibility, especially since Mr Cameron expected, wrongly, that the EU would make enough concessions to the UK in order to strengthen his hand in securing a Remain vote in the referendum. The referendum indeed had all the marks of political opportunism, with Cameron intent on taking the wind from the sails of UKIP, the United Kingdom Independence Party, which had been winning increasing shares of the votes in by-elections in 2011 and 12 in the North and Midlands. Come the next election, a number of Conservative seats could be lost given the same swing to UKIP. It wasn't the first time a UK Prime Minister had failed to take account of voters, nor the first time the EU responded negatively to the pressure for reform. With a number of European diplomats, diplomats privately contending that Brussels had made a grave mistake by conceding too little. The referendum was held in June 2016 with 52% voting to leave to 48% to remain. David Cameron announced his resignation next day. Theresa May, a Remain backer, unexpectedly became Prime Minister, promising to execute the decision to bring the country out of the EU. In the intense competition for the top job, which had followed Cameron's resignation, Boris Johnson was seen to be the popular option. His bid, however, had to be abandoned the very morning he was due to announce he was a candidate. For Michael Gove, his leadership campaign manager and a fellow Leave leader had become his rival overnight, it seems, stealing a march to announce he too had decided to be a candidate. Johnson stood down rather than split the leave vote. Without Johnson in the field, Theresa May, the Home Secretary and a Remain supporter came through to emerge pledging that Brexit means Brexit. She promised that under her as PM, the UK would leave the EU. There would be no attempt, she said, and I quote, to remain through the back door. The country, she said, had voted to leave the EU and it was, she contended, the duty of the government 
and of Parliament to make sure we do just that. She ruled out an early election and an emergency budget. May duly became Tory leader and Prime Minister and proposed that Article 50 should not be invoked until the British negotiating strategy was agreed, meaning not before the end of this year, th that year, and that Article 50 should be triggered only after the UK strategy had been worked out. The new government planned to trigger Article 50 under prerogative powers. And here I'm going to look at the third point, the question of whether, what did the challenge to government imply? What was it thought to imply? In triggering Article 50 under prerogative powers, the government intended to use those traditional powers enjoyed historically and derived from the power of the monarch without the approval of parliament including the power to make treaties and declare war. The timing for triggering Article 50 was a matter of judgment, with arguments for and against delay. The government intended to start Brexit talks with the EU by the end of March 2017 and to trigger Article 50 before then. During the nine month period, those opposed to Brexit in and outside the cabinet and government began to consider the options. Without a general election to follow the referendum, it remained the case that the House of Commons had a remain majority, and that majority was reflected also in the new cabinet. For now, however, remain voting MPs and cabinet, shocked by the Brexit result, initially promised to respect the referendum decision with Mrs. May calling the shots. That was not how matters were seen by some outside parliament. One strategy was to challenge the government's power to trigger Article 50 without first seeking parliament's authority. In 2016, the businesswoman, Gina Miller, seen by some to represent the reservations of many Remain groups, challenged the government's power to trigger Article 50 without consulting Parliament. Today, you will hear the legal discussion about this challenge and the favorable decision it received, first in the High Court and then the Supreme Court. But I'd like to leave you with one question and one point for reflection. The question is, are there matters which by their nature are so intensely political that they are better resolved by the two constitutional powers, parliament and government? The point for reflection is that the final consequence of the Miller victory was the opposite to that intended by many who backed her. Without the restriction of executive power consequent on the judgment of her case, Theresa May would probably have been able to sign with the EU her preferred deal for a halfway Brexit, in which the UK continued to follow most single market rules in exchange for what many wanted, seamless trade with the continent that she was forced to leave office as some groups in parliament sought to prevent her deal and others sought to ex usurp executive power to force their own version through, ultimately led to her resignation, to Boris Johnson's becoming leader and the matter being put once again to the people in December 2019. They returned Johnson with an 80 seat majority. The decision to leave the EU, its single market and its customs union and end EU law on this island was therefore taken directly for a second time on the authority of the people, not that of parliament, not the ex nor the executive. The ballot bomb box trumping the three constitutional powers. Thank you. Thank you, Sheila. We will now turn to Jessica Seymour, Queen's Council. Jessica. Uh, 
Thank you. Thank you, Sheila. You're going to find that um, I disagree with uh, many of the things you said, um, but the, the essential one being that uh, there was something to be left to Parliament or the executive, because essentially the result of Miller was to return power to Parliament. But I want to start by telling you the perspective from which I approach law as a practitioner. I did my training with the first Treasury Council who represented, who represents the government in all major cases. At that time, the prime minister was John Major. And over the next 15 years, I was on all three of the Attorney General's panels of council, representing the government in the UK courts, in Luxembourg and in Strasbourg. And in 2016, I was nominated by Michael Gove, then uh, Justice Secretary, to be the UK judge in the European Court of Human Rights. For the entirety of my career, including now, I've acted both for and against the government. And in so doing, I have never felt my integrity compromised. That is essentially because barristers, as barristers, we have a code of conduct um, that protects both us and the system. Our first duty is to the court, not to our client. We cannot make arguments that are unarguable, and we're obliged to disclose to the court case law that assists the other side if the other side has failed to bring that case law to the attention of the court. In the battle between the parties, the court's function as the third pillar of the state is to adjudicate on the law as applicable to the facts. It is neither for nor against any party. And I start in this way because the title of this event suggests that there is such a thing as the judiciary versus the executive. And that fall fallacy underlines the approach or underlies the approach of the press and even of some politicians to both the Miller cases, neither of which were in any sense revolutionary, nor indeed, in my view, surprising at a legal level. They certainly did not involve the judiciary against the executive. The role of the judiciary is to apply the law as provided by parliament and or the common law, so as to ensure that everyone acts within the law, including ministers and the prime minister. And that was the essential question in the Article 50 trigger case, Miller 1. Now that case seems a long time ago, but let's all turn our minds to the state of the country on the 24th of June, 2016. When the result came in, many colleagues at the bar who were concerned about the outcome contacted each other. We had numerous calls over that weekend about what the prime minister would do and the question of what was legal. Very few of us, myself included, considered that a prime minister would send an Article 50 notification without seeking both the consent of and a mandate from parliament. I confess that I assumed both at a political and legal level, that a prime minister would not only understand and certainly be advised by her lawyers that she had to go to parliament to get consent, but would also want to do so. This for several reasons. First, at a political level, no one knew what Brexit meant. No one had defined or even debated it. To have a negotiating mandate backed by parliament, I expected at that stage a series of risk assessments for different scenarios to be carried out, debates and votes on the basis of those risk assessments, and then a mandate for the executive to negotiate departure. Knowing that there was only a two year period to reach an agreement, you would have expected the government to seek a mandate from parliament for the sort of Brexit it wanted to achieve for the country. Secondly, no minister had a legal power to take the UK out of the EU. Ministers cannot act without legal powers granted to them by parliament. It was obvious to me that such a power needed to be given by parliament and that it did not exist elsewhere. Thirdly, notification under article 50 would potentially nullify the effect of primary legislation, the 1972 European Communities Act. Obviously, an executive act cannot override primary legislation. Only Parliament can do that. 
So I was confident that the Prime Minister would not take any step to trigger Article 50 without acting lawfully by going to Parliament. I assumed she would understand the enormous implications of the decision and want the next steps to be carried out with due care and diligence. Nonetheless, on the Tuesday following the result, Mr. Don Santos filed papers on the basis that the Prime Minister might trigger uh, Article 50 without parliamentary consent, and I was instructed in the case. Mr. Dos Santos became the second claimant, although in fact, he lodged his claim significantly before Gina Miller. It was at this point that a certain level of hysteria set in amongst politicians and the press, something not previously seen in the United Kingdom. Theresa May in her October 2016 conference speech condemned the claimants and their lawyers as acting against democracy. She said, the first thing to say is that it's not up to the House of Commons to invoke Article 50, and it's not up to the House of Lords. It is up to the government to trigger Article 50 and the government alone. Those people who argue that Article 50 can only be triggered after agreement in both Houses of Parliament are not standing up for democracy. They're trying to subvert it. They're not trying to get Brexit right. They're trying to kill it by delaying it. They are insulting the intelligence of the British people. That is why next week I can tell you that the Attorney General himself, Jeremy Wright, will act for the government and resist them in the courts. This was ill-advised political rhetoric. Most worryingly, it attacked individuals for taking the step of asking the court to rule on the legality of executive action. The ability to go to the courts and ask them to rule on the legality of executive action without suffering attack is central to respect for the rule of law. That political attack was escalated by politicians such as Ian Duncan Smith and Dominic Raab attacking the judiciary. These individuals, as well as others, started a discourse in which the judiciary were characterized as being undemocratic because they are not elected. Quotes in the Daily Mail after the divisional court judgment. Dominic Raab said, an unholy alliance of diehard Remain campaigners, a fund manager, an unelected judiciary, and the House of Lords must not be allowed to thwart the wishes of the British people. It would trigger a constitutional crisis if the Supreme Court upheld this vague and undemocratic verdict. Ian Duncan Smith, said the judges had participated in a constitutional crisis, literally pitting parliament against the will of the people. Leading Leave campaigner Douglas Carswell MP said, shocking judicial activism. These judges are politicians without accountability. The huge irony in all this was that what had in fact happened was that the judiciary had made clear that without the necessary power from parliament, the executive could not take the UK out of the EU. So again, the judiciary was acting to ensure parliamentary sovereignty and executive legality, hardly revolutionary concepts, rather concepts of which Britain claims to be proud. But this anchor against the judges served and I fear continues to serve political interests. And those political interests were furthered by the right-wing press with the now infamous enemies of the people headline reminiscent of the 1930s, at which even the Lord Chancellor Liz Trust failed to condemn, something Lord Judge said put her in breach of her statutory duty to protect the judiciary as set out in the Constitutional Reform Act. So what of the legal arguments? As I've said, I considered them neither novel nor difficult. When the executive exercises its treaty-making powers, that is the prerogative power of which Dr. Lawlor spoke. It's prerogative powers, uh, treaty-making powers, it does so on an international legal plane. It does not change domestic law. In our dualist system, if the executive signs or even ratifies an international treaty that has no impact on domestic law, no impact on our rights and obligations as British citizens, it is not until Parliament implements the treaty by enacting legislation that our law is changed. 
Accordingly, the treaty-making powers of the executive are limited to effecting change on an international plane, but not on a domestic plane. Parliamentary sovereignty means that it is only parliament that can legislate to affect our rights and obligations as citizens. The triggering of Article 50, however, would necessarily have impacted on a domestic plane, absent revocation within two years. This is because following the triggering of Article 50, the rights of individuals and businesses in the UK, as provided in the European Communities Act 1972, would necessarily be altered. That is so whether or not an agreement uh, was reached with the EU 27. Therefore, notification of Article 50 would necessarily alter domestic law, as it had been provided for in Parliament. It would alter individual rights, the rights of businesses, and domestic law more generally. That being so, to trigger without parliamentary consent would mean the executive acting in a way that fundamentally undermined parliamentary sovereignty. And that was the essential reason that the court found uh, Parliament's consent was needed. The European Communities Act was an instrument by which Parliament had shared its sovereignty with other states, enabling legislation made in the EU and rights conferred by the EU treaty to be directly relied on by individuals in the United Kingdom, as if they were primary legislation. Only Parliament could decide to reverse that state of affairs. The Referendum Act 2015 did not provide for that nor did it give power to trigger Article 50, so another act was needed. Any claim in that context, or indeed generally, that the judiciary is against the ex executive is frankly absurd. I can tell you from acting for both sides, which one gets far greater deference. The prime minister got it wrong. The hubris and rhetoric were in my view also quite wrong. And the media excelled itself in disgraceful attacks on the judiciary. Politicians, including the Lord Chancellor and the Prime Minister, aggravated the position by refusing to condemn those attacks. It was a sorry state of affairs. And both before, during and afterwards, the judiciary was quiet, careful and exacting. I remember amongst all the political hysteria in the papers and in the streets, sitting in court, feeling so greatly privileged to be part of a profession where rigor, integrity, and reason prevailed. So what now? I fear we are now seeing where this all comes from and where it is heading. In 2015, Policy Exchange started something called the Judicial Power Project. The clear agenda of this project is to argue that judges are political or politicized so as to limit their power, and possibly in the long term bring in some kind of ministerial involvement in their appointment, or even possibly their election along the lines of the USA judiciary, ironically, to politicize them. The 2019 Conservative Manifesto promise of constitutional reform. Since then, we've had Lord Falks's review, in which he effectively said there was no need for change, We've had a short government constitutional constitution, consultation sorry, on judicial review, a review of the Human Rights Act, and a few days ago, a speech by the Lord Chancellor, Robert Buckland, uh, in which he said, and I quote, we are attempting to return the political, to the political constitution model that was the orthodoxy for much of the 20th century. Now, I have no idea what that means, and with great respect, I doubt that he does. But I'm just going to quote, uh, give you three quotes uh, from cases that were cited in the Miller case. First, uh, Lord Bingham in the Banku case. He made the obvious statement that it is for the courts to inquire into whether a particular prerogative power exists or not, and if it does exist, its extent. And then the case of R and Wilkes of 1770. The constitution does not allow reasons of state to influence our judgments. God forbid it should. We must not regard political consequences, however formidable, soever they might be, 
If rebellion was the certain consequence, we are bound to say, fiat justitia ruat calum, let justice be done, though the heavens fall. And then the case of Zamora, the idea that the king in council, or indeed any branch of the executive, has power to prescribe or alter the law to be administered by courts of law in this country is out of harmony with the principles of the constitution. It is worth reading uh, Robert Buckland's speech for its lack of clarity, which gives a sense of menace. Clarity can be argued with, obscurity and platitudes, however, well, these for me bode ill. Dominic Cummings has expressed his loathing of judicial review and frustration that decisions need to be made lawfully, claiming that this means mere creation of fake paper trails, i.e. not real legality. That itself is horribly revealing and does not reflect my experience of the civil service. But perhaps from a diagnosis perspective, this is the heart of it. Ministers get frustrated that they can't do exactly what they want when they want, that they need to consider the law. My response to this would be that it's not new, but until now has never really been up for question. But if the UK wishes to continue to be a country proud of its common law and proud of parliamentary sovereignty, then attacking the judges and undermining the rule of law is not the way to do it. The decision to break international law and seek to remove the jurisdiction of the courts as we saw in the internal market bill. The resignation of Lord Keane, the Advocate General of Scotland and Jonathan Jones, the head of the government legal department were important warning moments. Vigilance from us all is needed. Thank you. Thank you so much, Jessica. We will now turn to Sir William Cash, MP. Oh, thank you very much. Well, I found all this very interesting because as a participant in the whole of the European issue, I've been on the European Scrutiny Committee for 37 years. I've chaired it for the last 10 years. And I actually understand, I was Shadow Attorney General, um, Shadow Secretary of State for Constitutional Affairs, et cetera, et cetera. So I got some sort of background before I came into Parliament as Jessica wanted and others wanted to give some further amplification of what they've been up to. Um, I was a partner in Dyson Bell and & Co. And I actually did the Quebec case. Um, I was instructing Lauter Pecht and Billy Wade uh, as well and Clyde Parry. And I've had quite a lot of experience of some of the issues uh, around all, which all this turns. I'm also a devotee of um, uh, Lord Bingham. And uh, his chapter 12, I think it is, of the rule of law and sovereignty is the classics text. Uh, not, I think, one which, of, which would have attracted much favor from Baroness Hale or Lord Craig of Hope Head, um, uh, or Lord Hope of Craig Head, because um, he actually took a bit of a shot at them in, in that chapter and also otherwise uh, for making assertions about the role of judges. Um, I, I, I actually practiced law since 1967 and, and therefore um, I, I sort of go back before the European Communities Act as well. So I'll, I'll leave my credentials at that other than to say that um, I always think the best way to keep a secret is to make a speech in the House of Commons, uh, which is quite a good way to view what's going on outside because it's so often the case that um, people don't actually bother to read what is said in Parliament. Um, we left the European community or U European Union lawfully and democratically. That is the point. Uh, it was also with a referendum, which of course made it that much more salient. Um, and uh, of course, ultimately endorsed by, after a lot of hiatus trouble and my having to call on Theresa May to resign, objecting to checkers and being a Spartan, which, we, if it, any, which it, some of you may or may not know, because we voted against the third withdrawal agreement for the third time. I mean, you know, the, the, the reality was that um, that agreement was uh, completely un, un, unacceptable for a variety of reasons we haven't got time to go into today. But the point that I wanted to make was that actually we did what was required and I don't disagree with the analysis on the prerogative and I actually think that 
um, parliamentary sovereignty is the most important aspect of our unwritten constitution. Um, I think I'm right in saying that possibly the only other country without one is New Zealand. Um, and I'm extremely glad that we do have one because it means that you're able to um, make adjustments as you go along. And I think that is a very constant. I, I also read history at Oxford and my special subject was late 18th century history. So I was very glad to hear of a case again, which Jessica referred to, the Wilkes case, Wilkes and Liberty, I'm so sort of <laughs> brought up on really. So basically, um, uh, if you sort of read your Lindsay Kerr, if you've read your um, uh, history and you've read your constitutional law and you've done a lot of international law as well and Commonwealth law, um, you, you appreciate that the world isn't perfect, but it also means that you do have um, an insight, uh, particularly if you've been in Parliament for the last 37 years, as to what people think. And I was delighted with the outcome of the referendum. In fact, as you see from my, um, the memo at the bottom of the page, uh, I actually instigated a Maastricht referendum campaign because I really didn't believe we could stay in a European Union uh, which ran its lawmaking through the Council of Ministers uh, by um, majority vote behind closed doors without even a transcript. And if you compare that with Hansard, you wouldn't think it was possible. I mean, I've been chairman of the European Scrutiny Committee and as I sit on the committee for 37 years, I know how it works. And anyone who thinks it's democratic must be joking. So that's the starting point. We needed to get out of the European Union because we were being governed by other people, other countries. And the British people understood this far better than the Remainers in the House of Commons and far better than Theresa May and far better than David Cameron. And, and that's why we ended up where we are. So I didn't have any great difficulty in accepting a lot of what Jessica said, or indeed for that matter, if I may say, uh, our previous speakers, including of course, Sheila, who, who's lived with this for a very long time. So basically, um, I, I just wanted to um, touch on something because we've heard about all the reasons why it was a good idea uh, for the courts to have arrived, and thank heavens, if I may say so, in retrospect, and with hindsight to Gina Miller for, uh, and the, her legal advisors for making sure that Parliament did endorse the decision to leave the European Union. We could spend hours, as I have, interminably discussing all these questions, but actually we are where we are. And uh, my uh, interest in this now is primarily in the fact that parliamentary sovereignty does mean just that, and I wanted just to um, touch on, I, I'm going to read out very briefly what Pink Bingham says on parliamentary sovereignty. Uh, he says, it is true, of course, that the principle of parliamentary sovereignty cannot without circularity be, dis be ascribed to statute. And the historical record in any event reveals no such statute. But it does not follow that the principle must be, m principle must be a creature of judge-made common law, which the judges can alter. It's, this is really where he's getting into the Jackson case. If it were the rule, if it were, the rule could be altered by statute, since the prime characteristic of any common law rule is that it yields to a contrary provision of statute. To my mind, it has been convincingly shown that the principle of parliamentary sovereignty has been recognized as fundamental in this country, not because the judges invented it, but because it has for centuries been accepted as such by the judges and others officially concerned in the operation of our constitutional system. The judges did not by themselves establish the principle and they cannot by themselves change it, to which I say here, here. So that is the basic principle on which I believe to be uh, the right way to approach this. I want to cut through the discussion which we've had so far by referring to the Withdrawal Agreement Act uh, which is the one that we actually passed after we'd um, ceased to have Theresa May um, and David Cameron and, and uh, Tony Blair and, and uh, John Major, all of whom, one way or another, in my opinion, got it completely wrong. I've spent a lifetime uh, opposing them and, and we are where we are now. But this discussion so far hasn't touched on something which I think is worth looking at and that is section 38 of the 
um, uh, European Withdrawal Act, uh, which was passed in uh, uh, January last year. Um, basically, what this does is to provide in domestic law the um, means of uh, overriding the withdrawal agreement and the Northern Ireland Protocol if we decided to do so uh, as a matter of domestic law. And I do think that um, some attention needs to be paid to this because it actually uses it's section 30, 38.2b, which was actually my own proposal and which I actually put forward in 1986 on the Single European Act, believe it or not. And it became, after all those years from 1986 to 2021, it did eventually get passed, which is that notwithstanding the um, uh, anything to the contrary, um, in any enactment or otherwise, uh, we would be entitled to um, pass our own laws overriding uh, the um, withdrawal agreement and for that matter, the um, uh, Northern Ireland Protocol. And th that really is a very, I think, interesting situation which we're in. Um, and I think too, that it, it ought to be uh, understood that we are not going to allow ourselves to be pushed around by the European Union now that we've left. We've left, as I said, democratically and lawfully. Um, and uh, I can only say that uh, at the moment, it seems to me that um, the negotiating position on the Northern Ireland Protocol is producing some extremely difficult situations. I think the government is handling it uh, as well as it can in the circumstances, but with the proviso that I don't think it would be wise for the European Union to push it too far. When I say we left lawfully and democratically, I mean we left the EU and notwithstanding, and I take issue with Jessica on this, uh, international law. Um, if you look at articles 46 and 48 of the Vienna Convention, uh, and as I said, I, I, I had some very interesting discussions with Lauterpecht uh, over the Quebec issue when I was advising Quebec back in the in around 1982. Uh, the bottom line is that um, the, the one element of absolutely clear um, right to terminate a treaty is when your sovereignty itself is impugned. Um, German, I've got a whole stack of cases which I explained in the House of Commons when all this was going through, but I, I'd simply, as it were, conclude by saying that um, the bottom line is that uh, the Germans, for example, uh, in relation to the Deutsch, the linking of the Deutsch back, the, the Deutschmark uh, back in 1973. I mean, Helmut Schmidt got up and said, you know. Uh, in, in the Bundestag, absolutely crystal clear. Um, we've broken every single rule and yet we're doing it. We're doing it because it's in our national interest and we have to do it. That was economic sovereignty. This is actually about uh, constitutional sovereignty of a country who everybody knows, and that's one of the cardinal principles of international law in this field, uh, that what our constitution is, that it's unwritten and we have the right to do this. So. I could spend hours on it and I'm not going to, uh, but I can absolutely assure you that um, as far as I'm concerned, the um, right for us to be able to uh, take the necessary steps if the EU refuses to accept, and so far we haven't reached that point, I'm glad to say, and there's some suggestion on the chilled meat issues at the moment, they're beginning to get the message. If they were to persist, in trying to upset the basic uh, um, understanding of the um, this unique circumstances, as it is described, uh, of the position of Northern Ireland, then I think we may have to take more direct action. Section 38 provides the opportunity for us to take primary legislation in order to achieve that objective under Section 38 b and furthermore, and lastly, um, in my opinion, uh, I think that international law is frequently thought of as something like 60% politics, 40% law. And there are circumstances in which uh, there are those who are 
ide I, I, uh, ideologues on international law. They believe it prevails over everything. I'm afraid that, that that is simply not the case. We found it so often in history over the last 200 years. It just isn't the case, but they'll learn sooner or later if and when the occasion does arise, but it hasn't got there yet. So I'm hoping that the common sense will prevail, but I, I would say I firmly believe in parliamentary sovereignty, particularly when it's supported by another sovereign act of, of, of a parliament, which was passed by all the, both houses of parliament by massive majorities uh, regarding the referendum itself. We left democratically, we left lawfully, and as far as I'm concerned, uh, we, 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 we do, we've done ourselves a great service. I support parliamentary sovereignty and I'm extremely glad uh, to, 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 to note that the Miller case endorsed it. Thank you, Sir William. Jessica, I'm not sure if you wanted to come back on any of those points, but uh, we'll now turn to Christopher, Christopher Knight. Christopher? Thank you very much for the invitation to speak in this event, particularly as, as very much smaller fry than my co-panelists. Perhaps what I can most usefully do, um, particularly for the students listening in my few minutes, I do want to keep it brief to give time for questions, because I, I know we're supposed to be finishing at 7.30, is to give a quick impression of what it was like to be in the council team for the government on the Article 50 litigation, and to that end, I'm going to try and avoid descending into the political fray. It was obviously a, a fascinating case to be in. It's always fun to read the press coverage of your litigation and be reminded of how wildly inaccurate so much of it is, sometimes flatly the opposite of the truth, whether by speculation uh, or design. Um, of course, it's rather less fun when the press coverage actively targets the judiciary. Uh, Jessica's uh, uh, averted to this in uh, in some detail in, in her remarks. And I don't think I reveal any secrets when I say that the Daily Mail's front page attack on the divisional court was both obviously outrageous, but also deeply practically unhelpful to the efforts of the government's legal team uh, to make its arguments as attractive and dispassionate as possible um, to the Supreme Court. Uh, of course, the, the political temperature uh, had considerably cooled by the end even of the Supreme Court hearing, let alone by the time its judgment had come out, because it was by that point, um, from various resolutions passed, particularly in the Commons, pretty plain that even if Parliament did have to legislate in order to give effect to withdrawal, uh, there was no real risk that it would do anything other than authorise the withdrawal. Uh, and the, the underlying political purpose to the legal challenges were, were not going to succeed in that sense. Um, there were many other challenges uh, involved uh, in the litigation. It's unusual to have one's written arguments poured over by academics almost in real time, uh, with a lot of complaints and pulling apart about the points taken and not taken uh, as a result, inevitably makes one uh, somewhat defensive. Uh, and it was a challenge to formulate the arguments, uh, and particularly in a manner which was easy and simple to convey. One of the core problems for the government's position was that its arguments was of, were of necessity rather more complex and fiddly um, than, in particular, Lord Panic's famous bullet from a gun analogy. That's not to say the government's arguments didn't have, uh, we couldn't capture, I suppose we couldn't capture the, the public or indeed judicial imagination in quite the same way. And that's not to say that the government's arguments didn't have some force. Um, Jessica described the claimant's arguments as neither novel nor difficult. Uh, and that might be right, but it's fair to, fair to note that uh, three judgments of the Supreme Court took a, a, a different view. So there is, there, there is something to be said for points to be made on both sides, none of which we particularly need to relitigate now. But it was also an object lesson, object lesson in the wider, longer term interests of government litigation in which losing the particular case is by no means necessarily the worst outcome uh, for the client. Uh, so to take uh, just three examples which arise uh, or arose in the context of the Article 50 litigation. Um, the first is the, was the effort made by the devolved administrations, the Scottish Government and the Welsh Ministers, uh, to use the case in the Supreme Court as a way to get the Supreme Court to say that the Sewell Convention convention that Parliament will not normally legislate for Scotland or Wales in areas of devolved competence without the consent uh, of the devolved legislatures. 
was by its statutory rendering in the devolution legislation now an enforceable rule of law. And had that been a successful point, that would have been deeply problematic for the UK government. Uh, and I have I worked a lot on that aspect and the court resoundingly rejected the devolved administration's position on that, uh, on that issue. And, and some of the consequences of those points are back in the Supreme Court today uh, and tomorrow. There were various aspects of the division. Secondly, there were various aspects of the divisional court judgment, which had it not been appealed, were expressed in a manner which were really quite broad and had real potential practical problems, posed real potential practical problems to how the UK went about exercising the use of the power to make and unmake treaties in international law in, in all sorts of really much more mundane situations and scenarios uh, than EU membership. And part of the reason for an appeal was to allow the Supreme Court to reformulate some of those points uh, and which uh, for the most part was largely what happened. Some of those what uh, the government might have seen as rough edges on the divisional court judgments were, were sandpapered off uh, in the Supreme Court's reasoning. Uh, and of course just about the worst possible outcome in policy terms would have been a reference being made to the Court of Justice on whether or not an Article 50 notification uh, could be withdrawn. Uh, and uh, that, of course, uh, explains in part why all the parties were content for the court to proceed on the basis uh, that a notification could not be withdrawn, even if it made some of the aspects uh, of the government's legal arguments more difficult. And standing back from the litigation now, uh, I think there's there's quite a lot of, there's quite a lot of legal uh, commentary. Probably not quite so, go, couldn't go quite as so far to say as a consensus, but a strong. Uh, a degree of legal commentary that the majority judgment, the, the Miller judgment, doesn't always read very well. Uh, and it's it, it can be unconvincing, particularly in this aspects of its bolting together of different strands of the argument without there necessarily being a clear thread running through it. Uh, whereas, uh, and that's no doubt partly a virtue uh, of pulling together um, uh, eight justices, slightly different views about the best way to resolve the matter. Whereas um, Lord Reed's dissent is undoubtedly a compelling piece of work, whether or not you agree uh, with where his reasoning ends up. And none of that is necessarily to say that the outcome is wrong, um, but the reasoning and the precise way in which the court expresses itself always matters to those of us uh, who practice and think about public law. And it, always, and it matters to the always ongoing business uh, of government too. Uh, but, uh, as a way into to opening the, the floor, I think it to to others to contribute. It's certainly right to say, as I think the, the sort of concept for this talk um, encapsulates in its title, uh, that the Article 50 litigation uh, does at least to some extent encapsulate a particular moment in time where the respective roles of the executive, parliament and the judiciary were a matter of real national debate. And it's not often that that happens um, much though us lawyers would like our cases to um, form the part of dinner party conversation on a day-to-day -day basis, most of the time everything that I'm involved with is so supremely dull that nobody cares. And I'm sure that's, well, it may be less true for Jessica, but it, it probably, even for her it's probably sometimes true. Uh, and and this was, a, this was a, a litigation context in which, in its outcome, the judiciary protected on one view or, or imposed on another view the role of Parliament over that of the executive, and that, uh, and I agree with Jessica that that's the real constitutional um, uh, divide between executive and Parliament, rather than necessarily between executive and judiciary, or and certainly, uh, and certainly not Parliament and judiciary, based in no small part on the perceived magnitude uh, of the decision in issue. Um, uh, the question Sheila posed at the end of her talk about whether or not there were situations in which um, uh, the issues involved were so political uh, that they were not uh, appropriate for judicial determination is a is a vexed question, and one to which there is no straightforward answer on constitutional orthodoxy um, probably would have given you the answer. That, yes, there were such issues. Uh, and some views of constitutional orthodoxy before the Article 50 litigation would have said that um, uh, it, it, treaty related decisions was one of those um, issues. Um, we know now that that has to be read with a significant caveat. Uh, and indeed, prior to um, 
uh, prior to 2020, uh, 2019 rather, um, uh, another co constitutional orthodoxy might have suggested that decisions around the dissolution and prorogation of parliament would have been a political judgment um, into which the courts would not have trodden. Uh, and again, we know now that that has to be read with uh, a, a considerable caveat. So the, um, I, don't, I think it would probably be a fool's errand to predict um, that uh, with any degree of certainty, the answer to Sheila's question, uh, at least in the positive sense, but whether, whether the answer is negative probably depends a lot on, on the situations which arise um, and as they come before the courts. But I will, I will pause there, so at least there's a few minutes at the end for people to, to weigh in if they want to. Thank you, Christopher. And thanks to all the speakers for such a thoughtful and interesting discussion. Would any of the speakers like to come back on any of the points raised by other speakers before we move on to questions? I take that as a no. Um, we have a few questions in the chat um, box. The first is, would it be okay if I could get the names of the cases that have just been stated? Um, I think, Jessica, that may be a question for you and some of the cases which you mentioned. So the famous cases, case of Bonku, which is a 2009 case, it's Bonku number two. There were many Bonku cases, B-A-N-C-O-U-L-T. And then the famous case of R and Wilkes, which is a 1770 case and effectively says there's nothing too political for the judges. The judges must ignore politics entirely, whatever the political implications of the decision, um, they must apply the law. And then the Zamora case of 1916, Z-A-M-O-R-A. -A. Um, there's a question about the 1972 Act. Um, it states, does the 72 Act preclude the use of prerogative power? Shall, shall I have a go at answering that? Because we, we had a lot of discussion about this and it formed an important part of our argument. Um, uh, our argument actually was that the 1972 Act, which took, I can't remember, we, we worked out exactly how many days, but a very, very large number of Parliament's sitting days. Um, we, we argued that by the 1972 Act, Parliament had uh, removed the prerogative power in relation to this treaty by effectively um, giving or pooling sovereignty, uh, effectively giving some of its powers or sharing some of its powers uh, with other member states in the context of the EU. And uh, that was accepted in effect uh, in Lord Sumption's judgment that from, from 1972, it was no longer possible uh, to exercise a prerogative power in relation to the EU treaties or Treaty of Rome at that time, and then the subsequent treaties, uh, which again were all passed uh, by parliament uh, with uh, debate. Uh, and that to me makes sense because we're not in a normal treaty related situation because parliament had acted. Uh, and you can look at it this way. If, if the government had been correct in the Miller case, um, then one wouldn't even have needed a referendum. A, a government could simply have been elected and said, right, we're leaving the EU. Uh, but Parliament had decided that the UK, uh, that it should share its sovereignty with other states in the context of the treaties. And so uh, the European Communities Act 72 had effectively said that there was no longer a prerogative power in relation to withdrawal um, from the EC. Could I just come in there? Yes, I, I think I'd also just add to that that the 1972 Act uh, was very clearly explained by in relation to the Merchant Shipping Act 1988, where I, I told the government, I said, I don't think you'll get away with this because, um, you know, they were t taking action, which I thought was, if they put notwithstanding in that act, then they would actually, notwithstanding the European Community Act 1972, which I've done on very many occasions in amendments and things of that kind, 
Um, I, I think that um, Lord Bridge in Factor Tame was completely right, where he said, you voluntar voluntarily decided to uh, relinquish your sovereignty. And I think it's more than pooling, Jessica. It was actually an abrogation. And that's one of the constitutional principles which has set me off since 1985 in my campaign to uh, seek to regain our, our right of self-government. Um, so the bottom line is that, and the second thing I would add is that when she said Brexit means Brexit, I gave a talk at All Souls and I said Brexit does not mean Brexit. Bre Brexit means the repeal of the 72 Act, which is really on the facts of 10 principle. If you don't repeal the 72 Act, you can't actually regain your sovereignty. And it's as simple as that. We could spend a lot of time on that too. And the other thing I would also just throw into the equation is that uh, when she came up with the checkers deal, I, I went for 100% uh, the, the morning or the, the, the day after the first day we had parliamentary proceedings. It was on the Tuesday, I think, after the checkers arrangements, which was over Saturday and Sunday. And, and I, I simply said, well, you know, if checkers means anything, what it does mean is uh, you're not repealing the 72 Act properly because you're not doing it. And that was another aspect of it. The repeal of seven, everything, if anyone's interested as a final anecdote, to look at how the 72 Act came to be enacted, do please look at the sovereignty file in the Q archives. If you really want to see how the government engineered the arguments uh, for the relinquishment of our sovereignty, which we'd established over at least 300 years on a gradually evolving unwritten constitutional role. And it's quite fascinating to read the memos that were written by the uh, legal advisors, including a chap called Ian Sinclair and others, um, monitored by Con O'Neill uh, to see the extent to which, frankly, in my opinion, the British people were, or to the British parliament was misled uh, as to the basis on which we were entering the European community in the first place as a matter of constitutional law. It's actually quite fascinating stuff, but I could spend hours on that and I'll leave it to um, others to chip in. Thank you. We are officially out of time, but there are two more questions. Perhaps I can read them out together. Um, the first says, surely the suggestion Sorry, another question has just come in, sorry. Uh, surely the suggestion that the referendum requiring a yes no response failed to provide the detail of what was being voted upon is acceptance of the notion that the great unwashed cannot be trusted to make such decisions. And the next question states, was it essential for the UK to depart the EU in the same legal manner in which it exceeded? Could I come back on that? Because it's really, those are two quite good political questions. Um, I mean, first of all, as I said in my remarks, uh, it was a sovereign act of parliament that conferred the referendum. And that therefore is an exercise of parliamentary sovereignty. Uh, the question had to be vetted as we all know, because it does by the electoral commission. Uh, the original question was changed because uh, the answer was perfectly simple for the purposes of the electorate to be able to understand exactly what was going on. There were all kinds of permutations suggested. Yes, no was ultimately the right thing to do. Uh, the British people are way ahead of most politicians and lawyers and um, pundits and commentators and leader writers. They knew what they wanted and they gave quite a significant uh, result. Uh, of course, the ultimate test was the general election after we'd um, uh, sort of replaced Theresa May and David Cameron and after all that sort of dithering and mess had been delimited and the paralyzing of parliament uh, and with all the Remainers and people on the conservative side backing people on the Labour side to stay in etc cetera, etc cetera. it was quite an extraordinarily interesting and appalling spectacle but the bottom line was that the uh, British people did make a decision themselves in the general election when Boris Johnson was prime minister, absolutely unequivocally. Uh, and that is the way it should have been. So it's a good example of democratic decision-making which endorsed the referendum result, which itself is a reflection of parliamentary sovereignty because it was an act of parliament passed by the commons and the lords. Thank you. 
Thank you. Um, there's a question. Demonstrandum, as they say. Um, there's a devolution question, and I, I won't read it, read it out um, in its entirety. It simply asks, given the importance to, um, given the arguments raised in Miller, and the conclusion that the Scottish Parliament would not need a vote on, on the decision to leave, um, was this the right way forward? Would anybody like to jump in on that? I'm more happy to pick that up, but it come, come, comes out of um, what I was saying, I suspect. Um, in my, I mean, in, in my view, I think the Supreme Court were right to deal with the Civil Convention in the way that it did. All, all the Supreme Court said was that the Civil Convention wasn't judicially enforceable, it was a, a rule of law. It was a political convention which happened to be uh, 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 included in a statute in words that were the words that indicated it would be very difficult for courts to enforce it. How does the court enforce um, the idea that Westminster would not normally legislate uh, without consent, for example? So uh, I, I think that is that is right. I think the 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 bigger obviously the bigger political issue was um, uh, was the role of the devolved legislatures in the Brexit process uh, and the degree to which specific consent. Uh, needed to be for political purposes obtained from the devolved legislatures or the, or the degree to which those devolved legislatures should have been allowed to act as a sort of uh, as a block or a, a holding mechanism uh, on the Brexit process because there was no doubt that the Scottish Parliament would have, have sought to, uh, to withhold its consent and therefore withhold progress um, had it been um, had it been possible to do so, but that's that's why the devolution settlement is structured in the way that it is. Uh, membership of the EU is reserved to the UK government because it's a matter for the UK as a whole, uh, and ultimately for the UK government and the UK Parliament to take those to take those decisions. You're quite right. Thank you. Well, this is clearly a lively debate, and we we could continue for much longer. But we're extremely grateful to the speakers for sharing their thoughts with us this evening. The third and final event in this year's Politea BPP legal series will take place on the 29th of July on proroguing Parliament, politics and the courts. We hope that this will be an in-person live event and look forward to seeing you in July, but we are in the same boat as everybody else and in the hands of the new Secretary of State for Health and Social Care as far as COVID-related restrictions on our liberty are concerned. Further details about the event on the 29th of July will be posted on on our website and provided to our friends and subscribers closer, closer to the time in the usual way. Thank you again for joining this evening. Until next time. Au revoir. Thank you, Edith.